This month marks the 50th anniversary of a watershed event in Indonesian history, the abortive coup of 1965, where six army generals were murdered and their bodies thrown in a well in South Jakarta. A little-known major general of the armed forces and strategic reserve named Suharto took control, placing President Sukarno under house arrest. He would go on to rule Indonesia for the next 33 years under what became known as the New Order Authoritarian Regime. In the immediate aftermath of the abortive coup, the Communist Party of Indonesia was directly blamed, which led to mass purge of communist, communist sympathisers and others throughout 1965 and 1966. Around half a million people were murdered by the army paramilitary groups and in some cases their own neighbours. The bodies of the victims were thrown into rivers and mass graves and those responsible were never held to account, let alone tried in a court of law. Joining me today to discuss these events and the scholarship and issues surrounding the 50th anniversaries are two uh, in, uh, professors of international repute at the School of Culture, History and Language here at the ANU, Professor Robert Cribb and Professor Ariel Herianto. Thank you for coming. Robert, let's start with the abortive coup. Um, in Indonesian schools, as I mentioned, it, it, in, it was taught as carried out by the communists. In, in the West, or at least in Australia, it was kind of taught as this, this mystery um, that undergraduate students should try to uh, solve through their critical thinking. Um, and then John Roos's book came out, Pretext to Mass Murder, uh, which looked at, uh, uncovered the role of uh, lower ranked army, general, uh, army uh, people involved in the actual uh, events. Is it still a mystery or uh, is, is Roos's book the, 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 the definitive account of what happened that night? It's the closest thing that we have to a definitive account, but it's probably not the, the last word to be had on the, uh, on the events. I think the, the two really important things that, uh, that Roos's book show are first, just how those junior officers uh, engaged in the coup, just how they planned, what they failed to plan, why things went, uh, went wrong. Uh, and it also shows that the leader of the Communist Party, Dian Aydit, and a very small group around him were also very closely involved in the, uh, the planning for the coup. Uh, what it clearly shows from that is that the vast majority of the members of the Communist Party who were blamed by the New Order government had absolutely nothing to do with the, the planning for the, the coup. There were rumours at the time propagated by the army that uh, there was a kind of mass conspiracy in which local branches of the Communist Party would engage in mass murder of their immediate enemy, enemies. And we always suspected that that was completely wrong. We now know for certain that that is, uh, is not the case. What we don't yet know is whether or how much there may have been international involvement in the planning for the, uh, for the coup. Uh, we know that Western powers were hoping that the PKI, the Communist Party, would stage a, an unsuccessful coup which would provide a pretext for its suppression. What we don't know, and we really don't know it, so it, it may not be the, the case, what we don't know is whether there was any element of direct manipulation or management or provocation in order to produce that uh, PKI involvement in the coup. Okay. Ariel, uh, as well as Indonesian students learning in schools that the, the Communist Party was behind the coup, Indonesians had to watch a film, uh, S, every uh, on, on the anniversary. Um, what, what was the effect of watching that film or that film being, being shown on the, on the anniversary during the New Order period for, for so long? I cannot think of a more important propaganda materials than the film. Um, for at least the first decade of its release. The film was the primary and perhaps the only source of detailed information to a lot of Indonesians of what might have happened during the faithful months of 1965. And what about young people today? I think the average age of, of Indonesians is about 28. So um, you, what about the younger generation that's that's come through the education system after the fall of the new order. What do they know about the coup? 
Of course, having said that, that was a very important propaganda. It doesn't mean that necessarily that people simply swallow everything that the government have um, given to them. I have noticed a number of misunderstandings on young people of how to interpret that. Mm -hmm. I have seen challenges and counter narratives to that. So there's been a mix of reactions to that. But I would say quite safely that, yes, most people were um, convinced that the communists were responsible for that because of the film. I was down at, at Lubuang Buaya recently where, where the uh, generals were thrown into the well and, and more funding was put into this museum of communist atrocities, um, therefore justifying the, the, the coup um, by the SBY government putting more money in. Uh, is this something that, that a lot of students, a lot of school students go to? Is, is the memory of, of, of the, uh, the coup still relevant in, in this museum or is it really just a something that is irrelevant now? Well, about two years ago I was there yeah. and I was quite surprised with the number of loads of buses that yeah. came to visit, but I guess they just wanted to have holiday. I, I don't think it matters what was it's there. It's near Taman Mini, so. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, but I don't think um, um, young people's understanding, perception of the event would be the same today than it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, most people uh, haven't even have said that they have never heard of the killings, mm. for example. Mm. And I'm talking about university undergraduate mm. students in Jakarta mm. who claim they've never heard of them. Mm. Well, let's talk about the killings. Robert, you were one of the first scholars to try to investigate uh, the killings through your edited book, uh, The Indonesian Killings of 1965-66. Mm. Uh, how has scholarship changed over 50 years on, on the killings? Well, I think the, the big change has been from an emphasis on the, the social dimensions of the killing to an emphasis on the role of the military. So when, when we first began looking at uh, the reasons for, for killing on such a massive scale, uh, it was very difficult to imagine that it could be an instrumentalist act by the military. The army could have destroyed the Communist Party by killing, say, 10,000 people or even just imprisoning 10,000 people. They didn't need, it appeared, to kill half a million people. And therefore, we spent a lot of time looking at the forces within society that might have generated hatred, might have generated antagonism towards the, uh, to, towards the Communist Party. And that involved looking both at deep roots, at antagonism between Islam and Communism, it also involved looking at the immediate circumstances, the, the way in which the killing of the generals was portrayed as an act of special brutality mm. and, uh, and cruelty. But we put a lot of emphasis on trying to explain why ordinary Indonesians might have taken part in killing other Indonesians. Now, what has gradually become clear over the last uh, 30, 40 years is that the role of the military in the killings was much more important than we had originally supposed. Uh, although the, those elements of social participation were still very important and all the stories that underpin those, uh, that, that social participation are still reliable. Uh, nonetheless, most of those who were killed were killed after they had been in detention under the control of the military or under the control of uh, security forces. And uh, they were then handed over to militias or handed over to other army units for, uh, for killing. So the, the shift has gone from explaining social involvement, which sometimes involved trying to look at the dark side of Indonesian culture, to trying to explain why the military was interested in killing on such a, a mass scale. Mm -hmm. okay. Ariel, what about in film and, and art or, or, or television and, and popular culture? How have the killings been represented over a 50-year period in a, in, in a nutshell? It's, it's, a very big com it's a very big topic and it's quite complex. I've seen over the decades there are many, many works have been done on this uh, in different forms, in, in art forms, in literature, in um, sculpture, in theatre works. There's a lot of plenty of them. They usually tend to be very um, suggestive rather than analytical, as you can expect. But one thing that I found a bit discouraging is that in most cases, um, the blame has been put on the, the victims. In other words, 
um, in narratives such as cinemas and, and, um, and literature, for example, the villains are the communists, or it's a very innocent villagers who are so gullible to be misled by the evil the communist, or someone who is so unfortunate to have married the wrong person, the communist. So in the end, somehow, um, the, the, the killings of those victims were justified one way or another because of the either being stupid or being so evil. Okay. And recently, of course, the, the documentary films, The Act of Killing and uh, the follow-up uh, sequel, The Look of Silence, have been released. Mm -hmm. um, Joshua Oppenheimer, American uh, producer there, um, has talked about the, the impact that this has had in broadening understanding or knowledge of the killings, both in Indonesia and throughout the world. What's mm -hmm. your summary of the impact of these documentary films? I think the film is important to sustain people's interest to remind them some of the uh, unfinished business, I'd say. Um, so it's a very good um, contribution to that. But also I think the film has been really good in three areas, I think. One is um, the fact it was presented in film with that powerful illusion of something so immediate, so you feel that you're there. Right. Secondly, the film I think is very important because it's very rare that you have the face and the voice of the killers. We have plenty of other cases of the victims. You know. And finally, I think Joshua Oppenheimer has been really good and generous in distribution of the film. Mm -hmm. He organized with a number of NGOs um, across the country to get access to the film, and free of charge, so to speak. So it's very generous of him to do that. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the act of killing? I'm not as positive about the act of killing as, uh, as many many people. Uh, it emphasises the, the role of uh, civilian gangsters, in fact a, a group of psychopaths in the, in the killing, in a way that I think distorts what we now understand about uh, what, what took place. Because we now understand that the military took such an important role in the, in the killing, I think that the film, partly by virtue of its, its power as a, as a film, ends up giving a misleading impression and it takes us back in many ways to the, the paradigm that we started with uh, 30 or 40 years ago of a dysfunctional society that is ready to destroy its own people rather than an Indonesian military that was willing to kill its, uh, its people. And I, in that respect, I think it's, it's a bit of a problem. Okay. Well, I, I agree with, with Robert. If you take the film as a representative of what happened. I don't think the film intends to, to present that history, I think. In fact, the film, I think, is, uh, I think I like the film a lot precisely because it depicts something that is so crazy, so unique, which I would not take you know, as face value as representing what really happened. It's a bunch of people who bluff about what happened, but that, I think, echo very much of what happened today, and that is impunity, the, qu the question of impunity. And a lot of the officials of the New Order were there in the films, you know, showing mm. how they give blessings to mm. these sure. uh, killers. So speaking of impunity, obviously there was hope that Komnas Ham and, and the Indonesian government uh, would uh, look into the killings. And um, where can you give us an update, Robert, of, of where we're at regarding this? Well, there, there have been a number of attempts to try and uh, establish some kind of a reckoning with the, with the perpetrators, or at very least to have an official statement of apology or regret for the, uh, the killings that took place and thereby rehabilitation of the, uh, of the victims, a, a statement that they were innocent victims rather than uh, deserving of, of what happened to them. Uh, and that hasn't happened. There have been hints of, uh, of apology, but th I think basically there is no one in government who sees it as in any respect in their interests to offer any kind of apology. And the, the political cost of an apology would be substantial because to everyone's surprise, anti-communism remains very strong in Indonesia. It's one of the, the few bastions in the world of strong anti-communist uh, communist mm. feeling. Mm. Uh, that's partly because of the, the effect of films like uh, mm. uh, Gay Tika mm. uh, But it's also a little bit of a mystery why communism is so disliked 
in some circles in Indonesia. Do, it, do, do you have do you have views on on that? I s slightly differ from Robert in that sense. Uh, I think there's been a change uh, among young people these days, and for better or worse, I think young people care less about what happened in '65. That worries me too. It's right. right. So I agree. Um, Anti-communist propaganda continues today, um, to surprise, surprise, and to the surprise of others, mm. and so have the mm. the, the counter uh, narrative to that. Mm. But what worries me is that neither the anti-communist propaganda or the counter uh, movement have appealed to the younger mm. generations these mm. days. So that's another thing, you know, for better or worse. <laughs> This is obviously, um, you mentioned the role of the West uh, before. This is obviously a, a deep, a time of deep reflection, hopefully for, for many in Indonesia and the Indonesian government. But what about in the West? What, what, what is the message or what can we reflect upon, do you think, in, in, in the West's role in, in this period, the 1965-66 Cold War period and throughout the Cold War? Mm. Well, we don't have any definitive knowledge on the contribution of the West either to the coup or to managing or encouraging or organising the, the killings. The, we have fragments of, of evidence which some people have, have uh, emphasised but which really don't add up to any significant role. And if it was a role, it was clandestine and therefore it was the CIA, not the mm -hmm. people of the West in, uh, in general. But it seems to me that the the big thing is that this took place in the 1960s and the world changed dramatically, I think, in the mid-1970s with the Cambodian genocide. Right. Cambodian genocide took place on such a huge scale that it changed the terms for the, the obligation of the West to be involved in human rights abuses in the, in the rest of the world. Many terrible things happened in the world before 1975 mm. that were basically ignored or brushed over the indonesian killings were uh, were one of them but but i mean it's ariel was it was it were we ignoring i mean time magazine said that this is the west best news in in years and i think the australian uh, prime minister harold holt had said uh, uh you know kind of the reorientation yes. has taken place over there we were, we were kind of this was the defeat of communism on yes, our doorstep yes, right yes, this, yes. this was seen as positive so uh, again i think robert is correct in, in indicating that uh, very cautiously about you know making wild accusation of uh -huh. but from my side i think it's also definitely clear that the west has been supporting in the sense of being silenced for so long has been mm. justifying what happened or pretending not to see the evils and in many ways protecting and, and supporting the regime that took a lot of benefits from this bloodbath, you know. Okay, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you, Professor Robert Cribb and Professor Ariel Thank Harianto. You. And uh, please sign up and watch New Mandala and watch it, uh, read our articles online. Thank you very much.